Dr. David Conley from Northwestern University. Well, I want to thank Lisa and, uh, yeah, Inter and Intersect for inviting me to speak here tonight. And uh, my opening slide here really is representative of my experience over the years with uh, research and how that translates to treating patients with chronic sinusitis. I mean, what do icebergs and chronic sinusitis have in common? And, you know, our experience has been that over the years, um, this basic definition of chronic sinusitis, persistent inflammation, uh, is a great definition, but it's, it's really challenging to apply in a translational way as to how we manage patients. And over the years, I've become more convinced that we have some observation and more over time of what is going on in terms of this fundamental process, inflammation. You know, inflammation is something we talk about all the time, we mention, it's the definition, but it's not applicable. You can't in the clinic, you know, say someone has an inflammation of eight or six or 10. And I think that when we look at our patients, you know, we see this and we just don't know how much is going on underneath the surface. So this very, Focus talk is about inflammation and how it relates to what we do. Now, a very wise man once said that if you were given an hour to save the planet, he would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute resolving it. And I think that uh, that's a good idea. In fact, that's probably very much in line with surgical mentality. You want to really make sure you've made a very good diagnosis that you've got your best plan in place before you go execute that operation and take care of that patient. And I think that um, the question is, you know, how well are we doing with that? Are we really on target with identifying what we're treating and offering our patients the very best uh, in treatment? And it's always a challenge to do that better. So back to my favorite topic, inflammation. You know, what is inflammation? It's the body's response to injury whether it's mechanical, surgical, you know, infectious, chemical. And the body has to respond to that and with the adaptive and innate immune system has to eliminate that threat and then heal. And if that works, you're not a patient, you're fine. But if that process becomes somehow dysfunctional and perpetual, you have a chronic inflammatory state. And if that's not bad enough, those are the patients that we take to the operating room those are the patients that we add additional insult to injury by operating on them and then expecting them to heal well. So the question is, what is this inflammatory process and what can we really observe of it? What can we see? Obviously, symptoms are paramount. They come first. The patient tells us what's bothering them. Now, if you want to drill down on that, there's all kinds of nuances and how people communicate that and what words and phrases they use, but that's what bothers them. If we dip down a little further, we get to things that we can still observe. We're still above the water or just below the water with our iceberg. And we see patients who have polyps or edema or thick mucoid secretion, and that's an observation of this inflammatory process, right? But it's just below the surface. And if you delve a little further, I mean, this wasn't always possible. CAT scans, I remember in the 80s, were pretty blurry. But now that we get nice CAT scans, we see that even with that observation, inflammation is not simple. We have people with focal disease who behave very differently than people with diffuse mucosal disease. They have different symptoms. They have pain versus stuffiness versus olfactory loss. We have areas where the bone becomes reactive, and that can be diffuse or focal. And then we have additional things such as you know, fungus and AFS, and, 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 and these patients are now all different. And so even though we're talking about a common driving process, inflammation, it manifests itself quite differently. And it's not surprising that these patients behave quite differently when we treat them medically, and certainly quite differently when we treat them surgically. Now, if you want to go even a little further, you know, good science in the last few years has demonstrated all kinds of inflammatory cells. I've just got nine of them here. And what's interesting about this is not that they're present, but they're present differentially. 
And what's even more interesting is that some patients that you might think are very highly inflamed and should have something like a lot of eosinophils may not and vice versa. And so we're always thinking, huh, here we're getting much closer to what causes inflammation and actually it does help a little bit, right? I mean, some of the recent studies in the last year or two have indicated that people with more eosinophilia have a higher potential to do poorly, but it doesn't always work out that way. So maybe this is a little deeper under the water, but we still don't have an idea of that iceberg and what we're really up against with our patients. Not only is there different degrees of inflammation, but there are different flavors and types. And I won't bore you with this slide, although it's my favorite. In the, la uh, yeah. In the last few years, I think we've made tremendous inroads at determining some of the really interesting, perhaps airway-specific inflammatory pathways. And this is what I'm really comfortable talking about. But as you know, these kind of studies don't tell me, oh, this patient has this flavor, and you do B with them, and you're going to get result C. So it's helpful. It seems to, we find patterns. Um, and I think that as Amber uh, commented on, in the future, we will be able to target some of these pathways a little more specifically. But if this has done anything, it's told me that all this research, all of these studies of measuring or trying to observe inflammation, is that we know a lot, but we don't have the whole picture. And I think that's why we see variability. So in review, when we see our patients, the symptoms are above water, the endoscopic findings are right there in the office, you get the CAT scan and you get a little more idea of what might be going on and certainly very few of us are measuring, you know, levels of inflammatory cytokines and, 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 and using that yet as a, a way of a predicting uh, response to therapy. But if there is any one thing that has come along that really makes a difference in patients' response to treatment, whether you're treating them medically or perioperatively, it's suppressing inflammation. And thank goodness we have steroids for that. The challenge, as mentioned earlier, is getting the right steroid into the right place. And these surgical cavities or delivering them, delivering them into you know, big polyp burdens uh, is challenging. But if that can be done, I think, especially when you take someone through surgery, through that perioperative experience, we have the opportunity with some patients to reset this process. And in the years past, without this modality, without good glucocorticoid steroids, we ended up with a lot more patients there on the left with scarring and synechiae. And now we see a lot more patients who have nice, open, well-healed, healthy sinus cavities. And just to go back to my earlier theme that we don't really know what type of inflammatory process are driving these patients, it's not always what we expect. Some people with very big, bad-looking polyps heal beautifully. And some people with very mild, patchy chronic sinusitis don't heal so well. But the its ability to suppress that inflammation during that time when you stir it up by doing surgery, suppress it perioperatively, that I think gives us the opportunity to press that reset button and get some patients to heal better. But what about steroids? And inflammation is not simple. Steroids are not simple. And in fact, the steroids that I grew up with are very different than where steroids are now. And we knew that when medications like fluticasone and mametasone came along, that there was an increase in efficacy. There was an increase in safety. But if you look at the old steroids, decadron, later triamcinolone, et cetera, those steroids are more water-soluble and less binding to the receptor. Now, if you put a water-soluble steroid, let's use Decadron, for example, in the nose, it washes right through the mucosa. It's picked by the, blood, by the bloodstream. It's metabolized, and it's gone. It works. It gets in. But it's just a very, it's a flash. It comes and goes. And you get systemic delivery, 100% with, de with Decadron, a little less with triamcinolone. But the new steroids, the new glucocorticoids like fluticasone and mometasone, mometasone is what is on this uh, device here, those are highly lipophilic. They're, they're fat soluble. And they're really nice and very highly binding to the receptor. So the really nice thing about this is that if they come into contact with the mucosa, 
They're deposited there for weeks and they stay there. They don't just wash through. So you get a continuous, sustained, persistent delivery of a steroid that doesn't just wash through. You have few systemic side effects. So you really don't even get any measurable systemic delivery. But it doesn't come and go. It stays there. Also, as Lisa mentioned, after years of research, you know, FDA required, we know that this is safe. It doesn't cause corneal opacities. It doesn't cause increase in interocular pressure because it really stays locally in the sinuses. So what does this mean? You have a device that helps you get the, the, the medication there. And the medication that comes off of this device stays local. And with innovative companies like Intersect, I think we know already about Propel and Propel Mini, but there's going to be other devices that come through. You may have seen some of the publications on the Resolve or the S8 device, where we may have options to treat people who have recurrences with these local devices without having, go, go, having to go back to the operating room. So that's very exciting. I think it's really a, a great innovation. So in summary, and we'll bring back the iceberg, in summary, I think that we see certain things. We get a pretty good picture, and it's becoming more clear with time what we're up against with our patients in terms of this inflammation. But what's below the surface, I think, will help us really fine tune our therapy, our treatment, and how we get patients through uh, surgery in the future. You know, this explains why people with polyps may do well, people without may do worse. I mean, you have people in the clinic like that, right? I'll do surgery, I'll have them come back, and I'm surprised how well the polyp patient looks, and I thought he was highly inflamed, and they look like they're healing very well. And you have the patient with mild, patchy, chronic sinusitis come back, and they're edematous, and they're swollen, they want to make synechiae. This is the mystery of what drives this process and how our interventions do or don't result in good wound healing. And I think that in the future, we'll have more and more devices like this that allow us to put that anti-inflammatory in the patient at the time of surgery and help navigate that patient around or through these icebergs, get them on their journey through surgery, through recovery, to a, a satisfactory or excellent outcome. Thank you very much for your attention.